Hello everyone and welcome to AP Human Geography. This is Mr. Elrod from Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, we're going to go ahead and start off today. This is going to be our first unit of seven units that we will cover throughout the year. Uh, what we're going to do through this first unit really is we're just going to go over some of the basics of geography. What exactly it is that we're studying, studying how we're going to be studying it. We're going to be looking at geographers. Uh, and what exactly it is that they would look at as they go uh, about their profession and studying the world. Uh, and we're also going to look at some things in terms of the basic tools that geographers will use and how geography really is, is different from the other areas of the social studies. So today basically we're just going to be doing an introduction to geography, just some basic concepts and ideas that we'll need to consider as we go throughout uh, the first semester, not the first semester, but the entire year uh, leading up to the AP exam in May. So when we talk about human geography, the first thing we want to, to look at is you know, what exactly it is that we're looking for. What is it that we're looking for uh, in the course and as we uh, begin to develop a geographic perspective, what exactly it is uh, that we're looking for. So you'll see this first point here says to one of the things we're looking to do is understand the world and its patterns. Um, so really uh, even maybe the most important part of this would be this idea of patterns. What exactly is going on in the world? Uh, do we see patterns developing? Uh, are things maybe coincidental, or is there actual uh, a relationship that's developed there? But again, and, and again, we are looking to understand the world that we live in, the world, the people that are in it, and, it, and this is human geography. So specifically, we'll be looking at people. We'll talking more about that as we go. One of the questions that comes up, and we'll be looking at an article uh, that discusses this, is this idea of the why of where. Not just asking why do things happen, but why do they happen where they do? Because in geography, space is incredibly important. And we'll be talking more about a spatial pers developing a spatial perspective uh, later on. Uh, so we, I have those two notes here. Why do certain events occur in certain places? And, and these could be either uh, human events, whether it's whether we're talking about war, uh, famine, uh, economic prosperity, certain types of elections, really any, any kind of type of human event, or we could talk about physical events, uh, physical geography events. We could look at uh, maybe earthquakes or uh, tsunamis or hurricanes and things along those lines. Uh, those are going to be elements really of physical geography, not human geography. But when we're looking at uh, human geography, we would then look at, well, how does the physical environment impact the human environment, how do humans respond to that, so forth and so on. And then we also want to look at not just events, but also places. Um, and places can refer to many things, whether it be a town or a city. Uh, it could be a, uh, a place of importance, uh, like a place of political importance, economic importance, uh, of religious importance, you know, maybe a house of worship, um, or a, uh, a presidential palace, or a capital building. Uh, any of those types of things. Uh, why are those places located where they are in the physical environment? What's important about that place? What kind of importance have people placed on that place? And we can look at several dif uh, different specific examples as we go throughout the year. But these are just some things to consider. This why of where. It's not just the why do things happen, but why do they occur where they do. Uh, and there's a phrase that we use, uh, and we'll be talking about this throughout the year, it's called what is there why is it there and then why do I care about it? So we, we addressed these couple of things. What is it? First of all, identifying what uh, is in a place and then we ask ourselves, well, why is it, why is it there? Uh, and then we want to ask ourselves, you know, why do I care about that particular thing? Why is it important to me? And as students, a lot of times this is the thing that we have the hardest uh, idea coming to, uh, coming to understand is why should I care about what's going on um, why it's going on uh, in the location that it is. And this right here, again, this what, it, it could be in reference to, to just about anything. Think about the school that you are, that you're currently a part of. I teach at a uh, school north of Atlanta, uh, and the students could sit there, sit there and ask themselves, well, why did the county pick this specific spot to build the school? Uh, well, a lot of planning goes into that. Uh, talk about the population of the county, and the school district and uh, you talk about major roads and thoroughfares where people have easy access to uh, its place make sure it's centrally located for the people that it's trying to serve uh, you could think about a shopping center uh, you could think about the you know the latest chick-fil-a um, chick-fil-a doesn't just throw a 
though I, I darted a map and say there that looks like a good place to put a put a restaurant no they they take lots of time to consider uh, they a lot of time and money goes into planning and developing and figuring out you know where is the the prime location for that specific uh, restaurant now when you look at Burger King Burger King just follows McDonald's wherever you find a McDonald's you find a Burger King that's because Burger King allows McDonald's to do all the work uh, and then Burger King just follows behind uh, but for the most part there's gonna be a tremendous amount of planning that's involved in determining why something is going to be located uh, where it is and so when we talk about the why do I care element uh, one of the greatest things that's going to impact us in our world today is this concept of globalization uh, and this is really why you should care about the things that we study in human geography even if you don't see uh, the direct connection to your life uh, currently especially as a young person in high school uh, and you'll see the root word of this uh, this term globalization is this term is global uh, so we're talking about is things becoming more interconnected uh, on a global scale uh, if we look throughout history uh, you see how a lot of people were either regionalized or they were localized and then they could only interact with the people in the very small elements of their of their town or their their local community or maybe even their country uh, but we know through uh, the various technologies that are developing in our world people and places uh, economies uh, you know, philosophies religions are becoming increasingly interconnected uh, and so through this interconnectedness uh, we're seeing an increasing interaction of peoples uh, and, and not just peoples but also their ideas uh, their ways of life, uh, their languages, their cultures, etc. Um, and so this is something that we're going to con continue to see as we move forward into the world. And so to become uh, people who are going to be able to interact well in that type of society where the world really is able to, uh, to impact each other in very short order, uh, we need to be aware of the things that are going on uh, in our world and understand how they're going to impact us. Now, with this globalization, we can see both positive and negative impacts of that, and I think we see it uh, the things that are going on uh, right now in our world. Um, and this is the year 2014. Uh, here recently, we've seen lots of different things going on. Right now, we're having a, a battle between Israel and the Palestinians in the Gaza Strip. Uh, there, a plane was just recently shot down. A Malaysian airline was recently shot down over uh, eastern Ukraine and in, involved, and that's a conflict between uh, the Ukraine uh, or Ukraine and Russia. Uh, you know, and of course, those are two negative instances. Uh, we have some positive instances where scientists are getting together around the world to try to figure out how to um, uh, to cure certain diseases, and of course, important that Malaysian airline were people who were headed to a conference. Uh, to uh, to help to study AIDS and how to uh, to deal with that particular illness, which is really really ravaging the, the continent of Africa, and so we see some both positive and negative impacts of that. So some positive things that we see uh, again across the world, people are sharing ideas, uh, whether it's technological innovation, whether it is uh, economic innovation and ideas, whether it is um, medical innovation and ideas. Uh, you can look at lots of different things, but we're sharing ideas, and of course that's through the internet, uh, you know, people getting together at conferences, uh, whatever it happens to be, and again, a lot of this, a lot of times this is going to benefit the people of the world. Uh, we're sharing cultures, uh, which is beneficial in a way that, uh, in terms of, we are able to come to know each other, we're able to, um, to, to see how other people live, and then maybe even bring in some elements and identities of other people's cultures into our own, uh, especially if those are, uh, for whatever reason, better, at least they're going to fit us, suit us better. We see this a lot in our food cultures uh, that we see in our local communities. We're able to, to reach out and we're able to, uh, we're able to participate in those food cultures, as they, especially as they come into the United States and some of our major cities. Uh, maybe it's something like music or it's something along the lines of, of dress, whatever it happens to be. Uh, we're able to uh, to touch base in those things, and then of course we talked. Just was mentioning this a few minutes ago, but technologies. Um, whenever new technologies are developed, uh, especially those that are going to be helpful to to human uh, to humans around the world, whether it's agricultural technologies or um, informational technologies, uh, we share these things a lot of times. Uh, either at conferences or companies are going to try and sh uh, sell them all across the world. Uh, so that they can make money, but again, those things are being shared, and people are able to take advantage of this. I think about uh, how many people in the world today, even some of the poorest countries, have at least a cell phone, uh, and not just a cell phone that they can talk on, but also 
a cell phone that they can connect to the internet on and so uh, the way that not only cellular technology has developed and spread but also uh, the way the internet technology has developed and spread and people are able to grab hold of a lot more information than they ever could and communicate in a way that definitely wasn't possible just uh, just 50 years ago uh, and this is something that you could uh, look at as either uh, positive or negative uh, with increased globalization we and we see the things that are out there in the world especially people in third world countries or uh, maybe some less developed countries uh, we see a, a desire for products uh, we see things on the television we see things on the internet and it, it creates a desire uh, in us you know we don't have it we would like to have it and so a lot of times when we have especially in America and in Western countries if we we desire something and especially to have it uh, mass produced and widespread we're gonna need uh, a certain element of cheap labor and so we've seen a lot of uh, shipping of jobs overseas been conversation of a lot of these jobs actually coming back to America because of increased uh, price of labor in East Asia, especially China, and also the increased price of fuel. So who knows, maybe this is starting to kind of reverse itself just a little bit. Uh, but this this desire for products, especially mass-produced, moderately priced products, uh, which is what the middle class in the United States is going to be uh, thriving on, we need cheap labor in order to uh, in order to develop that. People might go on and talk about also relaxed environmental regulations, taxes, and those types of things. Well, this is what really people like to hold on to, this idea of cheap labor, especially when we look at things like working conditions or we look at uh, child labor, things along those lines. So there's not really nothing wrong with the desire for product, but a lot of people end up having a hard time with though, this idea of a need for cheap labor. And so what kind of an impact that's going to have on uh, societies around the world. Uh, and then, of course, all these things are great, sharing ideas, cultures, and technologies, but the problem is, is when some of these ideas create a clash in cultures which of course we talk about conflict uh, and you look at the conflicts that are going on a lot around the world a lot of them happen to be uh, ideological conflicts um, and, and you know in the United States sometimes we have a hard time understanding uh, some of the ideological conflicts that are taking place across the world um, uh, but sometimes you just have a situation where people and their ideas are just so uh, opposed to each other and um, their worldviews are such that uh, they feel like they can't live in the same space, and uh, maybe you feel like I'm simple, oversimplifying. Um, but this is where a lot of our conflict in the world com uh, today comes, whether it's uh, political and economic, whether we're talking about communism, socialism, whatever. We're talking about religious uh, around the world. Uh, a lot of these ideas are going to create some type of, of culture clashes. Even, especially when we talk about culture, as Western culture is being distributed around the world, uh, it's creating a great sense of, of nationalism and a, a desire to go back to con a conservative form of traditional culture, especially in some countries because they feel like the West is taking advantage of them. And so it creates a backlash, a negative uh, feeling about the West. And so, again, there are some positive and some negative things that are going on there with globalization. Um, it really just depends on the specific instance that you're going to look at. And so when we talk about uh, impacts of globalization, here's uh, an example of that, and that would be the maquilador zones, which are found in northern Mexico. And so this is uh, a snap inside of uh, a, fact or a shop, um, not really a factory. It's uh, kind of an assembly point uh, for textiles. looks like blue jeans inside of a maquilador zone in Mexico. And you can see the working conditions uh, by United States standards, probably not the best. Um, you know, based on this picture, I don't uh, see any type of air conditioning system. I'm, sh I'm sure there would be a fan of some kind, probably. Just can't see it. Um, and, of course, if there isn't, it would be relatively hot. You see the ladies are standing, and you see uh, you see these ladies standing here. You see some sitting in the background on the sewing machines and things. Um, not terrible conditions, but probably not what we would consider to be up to par for the United States. And so you can look at this from one of two ways. Uh, these people are probably very, uh, they're, they're glad to have a job. They're glad to be working for a wage. In fact, that's what maquilador zones are, are, uh, were made for. But then you might say, well, you know, what are their wages? They're, they're probably paid lesser wages than what we have here in the United States. Uh, you know, maybe their the working conditions and the hours they have to work uh, would not be comparable to the United States. And so you might 